Uh, thanks, Yuri, for that really kind introduction. And it's really nice to uh, be here today and be able to talk to you about my work. Uh, I decided to mostly center this around uh, my fuzzing work, but we'll see how that touches into uh, program synthesis. And I'll be happy to talk more about that uh, in questions. And I mean, before I dive into the details of my research problems, uh, kind of the problem that motivates all of my uh, research directions is this fact that humans write programs and programs have bugs, right? Humans can't ever do anything perfectly, it seems. And the problem with software bugs, apart from the fact that, you know, they make programs not correct, is like they can be very expensive if they're in the wrong software component and they can even cause security and safety vulnerabilities. So in general, we want to find bugs before they cause those issues. But of course, in a lot of software, bugs can be really hard to, to find. So how can we help developers you know, identify bugs and hopefully root cause them and fix them? For software that's really like input-based, one of the best ways you can uh, one of the best things you can give a developer to tell them there is a bug in your software is to give them a direct input, which when you run it on the piece of code actually reveals that bug, right? And this is really nice because you have something dynamic, you can run it, you can see what happened in the execution of the program, and hopefully you can eventually fix the problem. Um, but of course, the big problem in the first place is how, how do you find such inputs that reveal bugs in the first place? And uh, that's the question that's really motivated most of my PhD work. So today I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what I've done so far. I'll start with giving you a background on this sort of coverage guide fuzzing technology that uh, really got me interested and engaged in this field at the beginning of my PhD. And I'll talk to you about how we extended that technology to go to different kinds of bugs than what people traditionally use it for, to kind of tackle the this great problem we have in automatically generate inputs, which is generate inputs that actually get deep into software. And then I'll touch on how some of the technologies we ran into as we were trying to just get deeper exploration into software actually allowed us, uh, actually enabled us to use different algorithms, both for testing and to approach, start approaching programs. So it's kind of where I'm going. And let me start with a start and give you an idea of what I mean with all this fuzzing in the first place. So if you think about how humans test software, the ideal way it should go is like this. You are a human and you think very carefully and you come up with some inputs to your program. And the idea is if you've done this task correctly, if you run your program on those inputs and no bugs show up, you have some sort of maybe not assurance, but you have some sort of trust in yourself that I did this well and that there are no bugs in my software. Um, but you know, beyond humans being bad at inserting bugs into software, uh, they can also not be very good at this idea of coming up with a whole suite of inputs uh, that actually assures your program isn't buggy. So going back to 1990 on this actually, uh, there was this paper in the communication of the ACM on the a study on the reliability of Unix utilities, so basic, uh, basic command line programs that people use every day. Um, and uh, what motivated this is that uh, one of the authors was logged into a remote workstation uh, on a dark and stormy night, uh, and he was logged into the workstation over a dial-up line. And there was rain on the dial-up line, and what was happening is that there were random, that rain was causing random characters to be sent to the programs he was running on his workstation. Okay, and this in itself is like, you know, one of, not entirely unexpected, one of the problems, of, I guess, dial-up. Um, uh, but what was surprising is just the fact that these random characters were being sent to the programs were causing these programs that were widely used utilities to completely crash. Um, so this observation is what prompted kind of the birth of this notion of random fuzzing. Right? So the idea is you have your program, and then you have a source of randomness, and you kind of sample that source of randomness a whole bunch of times to generate a whole bunch of basically garbage inputs, which you keep sending to your program until one of those garbage inputs causes your program to crash. And this is what we would call just like purely random fuzzing. And again, uh, so in 1990, they published this CACM paper and found a bunch of crashes and bugs and standard use Unix utilities. And 
obviously if you're writing a command line program and you're not doing random fuzzing, you're gonna run into these issues. Um, but when we're actually thinking about, you know, finding interesting bugs in software, you can imagine that this is only gonna get us so far. Right, this is sending random program, random stuff to your program, might be too random. Say when your program expects inputs with a certain structure, right, something XML -y or something, and then uh, you're sending complete garbage. You can imagine once you've fixed all those really shallow bugs, your program is just gonna be like, nope, I, that is not the input I'm looking for, so we're, you're just not gonna get anywhere. Okay, so what can we do to improve this? Well, one idea is that instead of starting from just complete randomness, we can actually start somewhere sensible, right? So say we know our input, our input to our program are gonna have some structure. Uh, we can start from an, a reasonable input to our program, like say a file like this, or if we're doing a JPEG parser, we can start with a reasonable JPEG parser, with a reasonable JPEG. And then what we're gonna do is basically perform a bunch of random mutations on this sensible inputs, things like this, which you know the inputs might not be perfectly structured, but they're a lot closer to the types of input the program is expecting. So now the nice thing about this is you have uh, inputs that are kind of random, but they're kind of close to what the program expects, so you're gonna get a lot further. And this is basically what we would call mutational fuzzing, right? It's not totally random, it's kind of random, kind of giving you weird stuff. And this was popularized in some tools in around the uh, mid 2000s to early 2010s. And again, this was a highly effective method to find bugs in programs because now you're actually getting stuff that's close to, you're actually getting those bugs that are close to what inputs should look like, but not quite. Okay. Um, but again, uh, you know, just on its own is not the end of the line. One thing in particular you'll notice with this, right, is that you're always starting from one particular input. So this is, so depending on how you're mutating your input, and here I'm mostly talking about just like randomly flipping bytes or maybe copying some stuff from one place to another. There's only so many places you can go from that one input to the one mute, right? So you're only gonna be able to find bugs this way if your bug revealing input is one step away from your original one, right? And what if it's the case that actually your bug revealing input is one that will only emerge after like a sequence of mutations on those inputs? So the just having one starting point on its own isn't really gonna get you anywhere. You could say, I'll just mutate them all and then I'll mutate all the mutants and then everything, um, but you're, that's gonna get out of hand really, really quickly. So you need something more sensible. So uh, innovation that came along here is kind of similar to maybe some ideas in genetic algorithms. Um, basically the idea is, well, maybe we can define a notion of interestingness of these inputs, and then we'll be able to make some progress by saving new interesting inputs. So you basically have this core mutation um, operation, but instead of just having like one input you can start from, right? You can start from a whole set of inputs. You can pick one of those and choose to make a bunch of mutants from it. And then the, the big thing is you're gonna instrument your program so that that program gives you some feedback about its execution on the different inputs. For example, like what sort of program behavior was covered. And then you're gonna define some notion of interestingness, which I'll, I'll get to later, right? And you're gonna say, well, the inputs that had interesting feedback, like maybe the ones that had new behaviors on the programs, are the ones we actually wanna put back into this set of saved inputs and start from there, right? And if we repeat this over time, maybe we're actually gonna get somewhere and find deeper bugs in our programs. Um, and this is what I call, or is generally called sort of coverage-guided fuzzing because this execution feedback is in form of coverage, and I'll get to that shortly. Um, but this, the tools that pioneered this really made a big splash in the te automated test generation community. Um, for example, that AFL tool, uh, here's just a fragment of its bug trophy case. And the really neat thing about this is most of these bugs were found by, by other people using the tool, right? So this was a tool that other people could use these are actually, this bug trophy case only includes the actual security vulnerability bugs, like only the ones that people cared about for security reasons. So, and the thing is it could, this tool could actually scale to real programs like Adobe Reader, or Mozilla, or Chrome, or all these other things. So this was a really exciting endeavor. And beyond, you know, that ease of use and all the bugs it found, it was also, these kinds of things were adopted quite widely in industry, like 
at uh, Mozilla and Microsoft. It's used extensively at Google, and I, I've done some work with Google on this as well. Um, and it's even been acknowledged in helping the robustness of uh, Linux utilities, right? So this coverage-guided fuzzing algorithm made a big splash in automated test generation. And that's kind of the starting point of where I wanted to keep exploring. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about um, is we had a few projects where we looked at these algorithms, we found they found certain kinds of bugs, and we were kind of wondering if we could widen the scope of what kinds of inputs these algorithms could get us. So this is some joint work with me and my colleague, uh, Rohan Patye at Berkeley. So before I can talk to you about finding different types of bu bugs with fuzzing, let's talk about what it does find. Um, what it does find is things that like cause your program to crash spectacularly. And oftentimes these programs are gonna be C and C++ programs. So expect that you'll find things like segmentation faults and everything that causes them, null pointer dereferences, buffer overflows, uses after freeze, all these really fun uh, memory management issues that somehow we wonder like, why are we still dealing with these in 2019? But we are. <laughs> um, so fuzzing is really good at finding these sorts of errors that you know clearly flag something's wrong. But this is not the only thing that can go wrong in programs. And uh, let me just talk about one thing, other thing that can go wrong. You can be executing your program normally and everything's running fine. And you run it fine on something. And then suddenly your user uh, actually comes up with some pathological input to your program, which causes the runtime or the memory usage or something to explode, right? Performance problems in programs can arrive really unexpectedly in cases where certain pathological inputs cause really bad behavior. And because these problems are quite difficult to deal with, there's been a lot of work into helping developers with uh, diagnosing and performance problems in their programs, right? You have these cool profiling tools that if you have that input that does the wrong thing, you can then uh, run these profiling tools, get a bunch of graphs that tell you hopefully how to help. Um, but I mean, the, the hidden thing in this pipeline, right, is that you need a source for this pathological input in the first place. And unless you're a really good developer that's thought about all the corner cases of your program, that's probably going to come from some damage having already been made by this performance issue. So the goal of our perfuzz work was to automatically generate these pathological inputs. And of course, since I talked to you all about this fuzzing, uh, we were wondering whether we could use coverage-guided fuzzing for this purpose. Okay, and why did we think that would work at all? Well, um, if you look at how coverage-guided fuzzing works, I kind of talked to you a bit about this execution feedback. In reality, what you're gonna do in regular coverage-guided fuzzing is instrument your program, so you get um, certain, basically all the branches that are covered by the inputs. So, you know, for each if statement, did it take like the true or the false branch, approximately. And then what you mean by interesting feedback is you're gonna say, hey, was any new branch covered? Say like I had if statement that only the false branch was always covered, and then suddenly I made a mutation and the true branch of that if statement was covered. That's an interesting one that I should keep going. Okay, so it seems like we could probably pretty easily adapt this to a performance case, right? Maybe we could say something like, uh, let's measure the execution time of the input, and then uh, you know, let's save inputs that execute for longer. It's kind of the natural thing we could do here. But actually, um, we found that this approach is a little too coarse grain. For programs where you know, you're looking at small inputs, you don't want to find the full-fledged pathological thing. You want to find the smaller thing that indicates what's going wrong. And in that case, execution time is really too coarse grain. You need a better notion of kind of the bad performance behavior. So to motivate what we decided to do, I'm actually going to talk to you about a particular uh, program. And this is basically a word frequency program, which looks at a string and should output the number of times each word appears in the string, right? This string has the twice, so the is counted twice. Why am I talking about this? Uh, because this program actually had a performance issue when it was shipped in a version of Fedora Linux. Why did it have a performance issue? Because it was implemented as a linked list hash table. Um, so a linked list hash table, the control flow graph kind of looks like this, right? You have some, you go through all the words in your input, you hash each word, and then um, you try to find the entry in your hash table that matches that word, and either you end up having to traverse the linked list to find the word you want, or that word didn't exist, so you need to create a new entry, okay? 
And this has quadratic performance uh, in the worst case. And we're going to look at that by kind of taking a deep dive into the performance response of this program, looking at this finer green notion of hit counts of these control flow graph edges. We're only going to look at four because we don't really want to look at all of these. So if you consider a usual case in input, like the one I showed you, right? This has four unique words. So this A edge is going to be executed four times. One word has the same hash. Um, so that B edge is executed once. And in fact, the word that has the same hash is the same word, right? It's the. So only that D edge is going to be executed. Um, now, this little table here looks very different in the what is traditionally the pathological case here, right? Which is that when you have a whole bunch of hash collisions. I didn't actually do the math here. These words don't actually hash collide with each other. But if we imagine they do, right, you would get something like those B and those C edges being executed almost like a quadratic number of times in the amount of words you have. Um, but the interesting thing here is, right, this A edge isn't really executed that many more times than in the original case, right? Seven, four, it's not that different. Um, but what if in your program, actually, what was really expensive was uh, creating new entries, right? That's, that might be another kind of performance behavior you'd be interested about. What is the input that gives me the worst kind of entry creation? And that's going to be something with a lot of really small words, right? This executes the A edge much more than uh, either of the other results. Now, the neat thing to observe about these cases is the pathological sort of pathological performance behavior is really characterized by excess hit counts to a few of these edges, right? It's like in this case, it's the B and the C. Here, it's the A. So this leads kind of a, a natural idea is to say, well, maybe what we can do to try to find a variety of inputs, kind of giving us all the bad performance behaviors in our program, is to maximize the edge hit count independently for, for each different edge. Right, so we need to try to find input that maximizes A, one that maximizes B, one that maximizes C, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is exactly what we tried to do in first class, right? So we modified our instrumentation of the program. So instead of just looking at the branch that's executed, we actually get information about the number of times each edge was in the program was hit. And then we save inputs if they maximize the number of hit counts for some edge. And then we pick inputs for mutations. We pick inputs that are already maximizing the hit counts for some edge, right? So that hopefully we can make some progress here. And the neat thing about this is it actually worked in terms of finding uh, bigger algorithmic complexity, even though we were just maximizing all these things independently. Um, so one of the ways we can measure this is on benchmarks where we know what the worst case complexity is. You look at what's the worst input that perf has generated for each input length. Um, and we compared this to some existing state of the art that was using fuzzing to try to find worst case behaviors. And what we found is that perfuzz was consistently able to find uh, like complexity curves that were close to the worst case. Um, so we have the other, the other tool also worked for insertion sort, which is quite a simple program. But as we go to like regex matching, perfuzz was able to get through all the complexity and actually find that quadratic behavior. And you might be wondering, well, that doesn't look quadratic to me for that word frequency thing. Um, but actually, word frequency is quadratic in the number of words, not the input length. And what we saw from analyzing this here is that the other state of the art could only generate a lot of short words, so kind of that other worst case. Whereas perfuzz was actually able to generate inputs that had all hash collisions and actually some funky behavior in the insertion later on. And so it's a really cool example that I'm happy to show later on. We also ran this on like regular programs where we didn't know if anything would go wrong, like an XML parser. And we found that, you know, we found a 500 byte input that hit a loop in XML string copy like over 200,000 times, which seems a little excessive. And when we looked at running that input through the program, um, we found this kind of curious thing, which was this input basically caused errors everywhere it went. And in its error handling, um, this program was like copying the context every time. And you can see how you basically got quadratic complexity in kind of the, the syntax error handling uh, of this input. So this is really, really cool because just by doing this kind of independent maximization thing, um, trying to look for different hotspots in the program, we were able to find sort of performance issues in real world programs. Um, and, and one thing I want to talk about here is, you know, I've talked about edges and hit counts, but if you kind of look at this algorithm, it's not really that particular to just edges, control flow graph edges and hit counts, right? Uh, 
we can abstract this away to just an algorithm where we're trying to maximize values for a bunch of keys you're giving us about the program's execution. And the neat thing is with this, we can solve a lot of different problems. Like for example, um, say we want to find inputs that maximize memory allocations in our programs, right? That could cause us to run out of memory. Then we could keep track of all the locations where there are memory allocations in the program. And then for our values, we could track the cumulative amount of memory allocated at each of those locations, right? And now let's run front fuzz and try to maximize the amount of memory allocated. Or kind of in a different domain, one thing fuzzing has an issue with is like these hard comparisons. So say you have a program with a branch where something has to e equal a very specific symbolic value. This is a thing where testing techniques like symbolic execution can get through quite easily. But you can do, imagine if you're randomly mutating X, it's going to get quite hard to get here. But what if you actually store all these locations as keys, and then as values, you keep track of the number of bits matched, and then run this performance fuzzing algorithm from there? Then maybe you can actually get through these hard comparisons without having to do complex symbolic analysis. So with this in mind, and also uh, noticing that a lot of people were building kind of domain-specific fuzzing algorithms that were kind of just speaking those parts, uh, we decided to build this uh, framework called Fuzz Factory. And basically what Fuzz Factory does is, first of all, it is, generalizes this even further. Turns out maximization is not the only kind of summarization you want to do. Sometimes you might, obviously, this will work for minimization. It can also work for like set union and some other things. So we allow that to be generalized. And the other thing we did, which I kind of swept under the rug earlier, is that in all these loops, you have this instrumentation into the program. And exactly how that's built is pretty tightly related to this basic search loop. Like you're kind of assuming that this instrumentation exists, and thus that you know the search loop will work. Um, so what we did in Fuzz Factory is we actually provided a much easier way to kind of inject that feedback into the program that lets you keep this search algorithm thick while and be able to achieve domain specific goals by just inserting kind of different types of instrumentation. And what we did in evaluating this, first of all, we just said like, so now we can actually quite easily prototype a whole bunch of domain specific fuzzers. People had been, uh, had the slow fuzz and perf fuzz I talked to you earlier about. Um, we had also done, I'll touch on this kind of validity fuzzing idea later. And we were able to quite easily build the fuzzers for these comparisons and memory allocations. And we were even able to quite easily build a fuzzer that targeted diffs in programs, right? You might want to target code that's been recently modified. So you can just put extra feedback about, you know, how many times the diff, and then uh, that seemed to, you know, the prototype at least worked. We were able to quickly build a prototype that showed this is a viable idea. So this was really cool. And actually, one of the cooler things about this is that this neat separation of that algorithm and the feedback you're injecting allows you to really easily compose these feedbacks in a way that before you would have to have to tweak the algorithm to take care of all these different maps. But now you can easily say like, hey, what if I want inputs that both uh, maximize memory allocations and get through these hard comparisons, right? We were able to quite easily build that and be able to build this super fuzzer that composed those two domains. And the neat thing about this, this is measuring like the maximum memory allocations is if you just tried doing the memory fuzzing alone, that's the green bar there, you weren't getting anywhere. But once you actually compose that feedback with that hard with getting through those hard comparisons, we were able to find legit buggy uh, memory allocation behavior because going from a 20 byte input to a four gigabyte allocation is far beyond the compression ratio that's allowed by these programs. And I think this bug was actually caused by a typo in a C macro, so that was that was a that was a fun one to find. So the moral of the story of all these works, right, is that this coverage guided fuzzing kind of algorithm is actually, you can actually generalize it to kind of more general feedback direct fuzzing and use it really effectively to solve other kind of bad behavior input problems. Um, but now something that haunted me nonetheless here is kind of the problem of, you know, that XML like error parsing example I showed you, right? We're, we're still just looking at inputs that were malformed and causing like syntax errors in our program. So one of the things we wanted to investigate was whether um, we could actually find inputs that go deeper into the program and 
actually find bugs in you know this deep core logic of the perf. And this is some work with me and my advisor, as well as again with my colleague uh, Rohan Padier. Um, so, what do I mean by like deeper exploration? Right. If you look at a lot of the programs we fuzz, there's usually going to be some sort of input validation stage, and then there's going to be some core logic of the program. And if you look at where fuzzers find bugs, they mostly find bugs crawling around in that input validation stage, of which there are many because input validation is is a difficult task. But as a testing person, what I'm really interested about is finding bugs that are deeper in the core logic. So we can ask, like, why, why are fuzzers stuck here? And I think one of the big reasons is because of the way they're generating inputs, right? We're generating inputs by doing random mutation on inputs that are otherwise well structured. And that's not going to get us anywhere, right? Say um, we have this program where in our input validation phase, we have some sort of like strong if statement guard on the, on the structure of the input. And say we have an input that actually gets through that if statement, right? So it, it, it satisfies this if statement and it can actually get through the core logic of the program. However, this is a difficult thing to maintain for a random mutant, right? And if you try to randomly mutate this input, you'll find again and again that most of the random inputs you're, you're generating uh, no longer satisfy this uh, core check, and so you're never actually going to get into core logic of the programs. If you're never getting there, you're never going to find bugs there, which is kind of what we care about. Okay, so what we were wondering, so the first thing we can wonder is, um, well, what if we just find the places where we are allowed to mutate inputs and we can still get into the core logic of the program? And that's what we tried to do with our FairFuzz work. So the idea of FairFuzz, first of all, is we need to kind of um, pick inputs that hit these rare branches in programs, ones that very few other fuzzer inputs are able to get to, because those are the ones that might be guiding core logic. And then uh, we're going to restrict mutation to certain locations with this thing I call the branch mask. And this is kind of the, the key innovation here. So let me actually give you a high level idea of what I mean by that. Um, so the idea is the following. So you have a program. You have some branch that is hit by very few fuzzer generated input. In this case, like the true side of this if statement, probably very few fuzzer inputs are going to have hit. Then you come up with some input that actually, you have some input that actually hits that rare branch. And now the question you want to answer is, where can I mutate this input and keep hitting that rare branch with the idea that then I can generate a lot of mutants and maybe get further down into the program as long as I'm still keeping that branch fixed. In this case, the answer is like you can mutate these two places in the middle and then hopefully you can modify some things and actually get deeper. And then once you have that information, right, this is what we would call the branch mask. Now you're going to say now only generate mutants at places where they're allowed. And then you would generate all these mutants, which hopefully still hit that rare branch you want and hopefully get you deeper into the core logic of the program. So that's exactly what we tried to do in FairFuzz. You can imagine that totally computing that information perfectly is going to be very expensive. But there was actually a way we could do it while hijacking onto the fuzzer's regular mutation of inputs, which is the following. So the fuzzer generates inputs by like mutating each byte, first of all. And what we did is we hijacked that part and we say, okay, let's mutate the first byte and observe whether this mutant hits the branch. If it does not, mark that byte as not okay. Do the same thing with the second byte. Still doesn't hit the branch, mark that byte as not okay. Keep doing this with the input, with the input. And you hope that at some point you get to a point where you mutate and it actually still hits that rare branch. So you can mark these two positions as okay. And you keep doing this for the whole input, right? And the neat thing about this is you don't need any in extra instrumentation. You don't need to actually know what this if condition is doing. You just need to observe the dynamic behavior of the program, which is something we already have with these fuzzers. Um, and then once you do this for every position, you can summarize that information in the branch mask. Right? And this might be over approximate because you're only mutating each position like once, but it gives us a nice little summary. And as I said, this like branch mask computation is actually quite neatly integrated into the mutation stage, so it doesn't add too much overhead. And uh, because of that, when we evaluated FairFuzz, 
the blue line up against a bunch of other different fuzzers in terms of the branch coverage it achieves in the entire program. We found that it generally had the upper cap in terms of coverage uh, compared to all the other best variants of this AFL. And in particular, what we found is that programs on which it really helped us get deeper into the programs were ones where we had a lot of nested conditional structure. So some programs are structured like this, like say packet parsers or whatnot, where it's like, if this thing is equal to that thing, and then if this thing is equal to that thing, then this technique actually gets you quite far. So this is nice. We have a technique that works in particular for these types of highly nested programs. It kind of does kind of a depth first thing. Um, but it didn't work for all kinds of programs. So we went back to the drawing board and we were wondering, well, can we get any further if we actually have information about the structure of the input that the program expects? So when I talked to you about random fuzzing, I told you like either we have random fuzzing or we have mutational fuzzing, but there's actually um, something else we can do, which is instead of generating totally random inputs that are just like random characters, we can have a specially written input generator. And what this input generator does is it generates kind of random looking data, but according to some sort of constraints or logic within the generator. So, you know, you'll be able to generate much more structured inputs. Um, uh, now, obviously, this input generator is something you have to write. Let me just give you an example of kind of what that would look like in one of these cases. So say you want to generate XML documents, right? Uh, you would first of all choose like a random string to put in the main tag of your XML document. Then you would choose like a random number of children for your XML document. Then you would recursively call this generator to generate child trees for each of your children. Then you might like randomly choose to add some string or randomly choose to add some attributes. And at the end, you would return this XML document tree, which you can then you know, easily serialize. And if you need to, you can either directly test APIs that take in this tree, or you can serialize it, and give it to your front end. So um, this does work. This definitely gets deeper than you would by just doing purely, sending purely garbage characters to your programs, right? It'll probably get you through the input validation stage uh, more. Um, but there are still some drawbacks. In particular, say you're um, taking in XML documents of a certain schema. You might not want to write a specialized generator for that schema. You might just want to use a general document generator, in which case not all inputs will get through. And the ones that get through might only explore a small part of the core logic of your program. And kind of the sad thing here is that if we can get that same execution feedback that we could get with the like coverage guided fuzzing, right? Like we can get that the input passed all the validation steps, or we can get that, oh, it covered new core logic. Um, in that mutational ways, we had ways of saying like, this was good, you should keep doing things like this. Here, it's not entirely clear how we can tell the generator, that was good, you should keep generating inputs like that. And that's kind of a fundamental issue here. Okay. So we were trying to solve this problem, and the thing we had to ask here is, what controls what input is generated here? Um, if you look at what controls what input is generated, it's going to be these calls to random, basically. right? Whatever these calls to random return uh, influences what input is generated. And those calls to random come from this random source. And OK, you don't have to follow me all the way here, but basically this, this random source's randomness is really fundamentally just gonna be like a sequence of pseudo random bits. Somewhere on your computer, you have a random number generator generating random bits. And then all of these like next string and next int functions you're doing is nicely massaging those bits into the type of input that you wanted, right? Like this random next int is always gonna give you something between zero and max children, no matter what kind of pseudo random bits underlie the random. All right, so this sequence of pseudorandom bits corresponds directly to a highly structured input that you can give to your program. And the neat observation is um, now if you mutate those pseudorandom bits, right, so you just change them slightly, that's going to affect what one of these calls to random returns. And that in turn is going to slightly affect the input that you generate. Uh, so here, right now, you get from foo to woo, and that would modify everything nicely. You don't have like an uneven mutation like you do if you're directly mutating bytes. Of course, some mutations will be more destructive, like if you change the number of children, you'll get rid of a whole subtree. Um, but nonetheless, now we have a hook 
where we can do mutations and kind of change the input. So the first thing we said is, okay, we need to view this generator not as a thing that just goes from nothingness to generating inputs, but it's something that actually accepts a string of, accepts a sequence of random parameters and goes from that to a particular input. And now we can look at that parametric generator workflow and our coverage guided workflow, and we say, hey, I think we can integrate these, right? Where are we gonna integrate it? We're gonna just paste it in right there. So that instead of directly modifying the inputs to the program with our mutation loop, we're modifying those random numbers that affect the input to our program, but we still get this nice coverage guide fuzzing loop. So this is what we did in the Zest tool. First of all, the big difference is that we have this generator that's integrated into this loop. And the second difference is this validation validity fuzzing I mentioned, right? Again, we find that we have to slightly tweak what's interesting and slightly tweak the feedback. Um, in particular, uh, say you have a generator for general XML documents, but you actually want to generate stuff that fits the particular schema. You want to reward this more for generating documents that fit the schema. Okay, uh, some summary statistics um, compared to regular coverage guide fuzzing or generator based fuzzing, our Zest tool finds semantic bugs, so ones that are actually in that core logic, um, much more reliably and quickly. So we had more unique bugs than the other uh, tools, and the, the, a darker bug means that we found it, this is a random technique, so we need to repeat trials. Uh, darker bugs means that we found it consistently across different random trials. And to kind of give you a flavor of the kind of bugs you can find, uh, you can find really complex semantic things, uh, like this is some JavaScript we generated, and this actually causes an illegal state exception in this compiler, and the reason for that is some details of uh, JavaScript that I don't need to get into right now, but basically, um, in its dead code elimination phase, the compiler is trying to get rid of all this code, and it turns out, because the JavaScript is weird, you can't actually get rid of this code, and it caused uh, an exception. So, right, so the point here is that we can actually find really deep, complex semantic bugs. And I don't know if you can imagine finding going all the way here with just doing random byte-based mutations, but you're not going to get there. So for me, the big takeaway of these two works is that in this loop where we have these mutations, oops, uh, if you smartly control the mutation strategy, you can actually get much deeper into exploring the program. But along the way, I got really interested actually in this generator abstraction because this idea of like a thing that generates random data, but we can make it not quite random is actually something that shows up in a lot of other problems. And this prompted me to do some work um, both with uh, an undergrad, uh, Samir, uh, on RL check, and as well as with another collaborator also named Rohan, but a different one on this program synthesis that I, I, I sneaked out earlier. So the thing I want to say is like we did all this effort to put this generator into this loop um, so we could do this coverage guided fuzzing thing. Um, but why restrict ourselves to that, right? We, we try and try to massage in that particular thing, but maybe there's other things we can do in terms of processing that execution feedback and using that to guide the generator beyond just, you know, these bit mutations. So say we're generating like a binary tree, for example. Um, uh, you want to generate a binary tree, you'll start by choosing randomly like a value for that root node, say two. Then you'll randomly choose whether to generate a left child, say we do, right? We recursively call the generator again, we get into this recursive call, and now we need to make a random choice of value. Now, if I want to generate any old binary tree, I can do whatever I want here. I can choose any of these values. But what if I want to generate actually a binary search tree, right? A binary search tree has a bunch of invariants on it, of which one of them is that the left child should have a smaller value than the, than the root node, right? So if you're trying to generate uh, something that's valid under those constraints, there's only a few choices that are actually good at this point, right? Only zero and one will actually get you uh, something good. And obviously, binary search tree is a pretty easy thing to write a generator for, but let's pretend it's more complicated like those eggs and all schemas or whatever. So what we can ask here is that instead of going through this weird backdoor of the random parameters, we can ask like, can we actually directly control these choices and come up with some models to kind of control that randomness? 
in particular, we want to control them so that we maximize the chance of generating a valid input according to some validity function we have. Um, but the thing is, the answer to like what is a good value for this choice depends on the context of that choice, right? So, say we're generating the binary search tree, right? The good value for value there depends on whether you're the left child of the two, or the right child of the two, or the right child, or the left child of the right child of the two, right? The the context really affects what are the good choices here. So, in our first, so let's make a first attempt to solve this problem, and the first thing we're going to do basically is we say, let's directly put some context in this generator. Um, so in this case, the context is going to have, like, basically keep track of all the dot choices I've taken. And for my recursive calls, it needs to give me an idea of where I am in this, like, recursive structure. And then what we need to figure out is how can we make choices that take this context in mind, right? And that basically condition themselves on that context. So our problem setting is as follows, right? We have a choice point where we have some choice space and we need to figure out the correct choice to take in that choice space given a particular value of the context. Um, and the thing I noticed here is this kind of sounds similar to like we have an action space. We have some actions we want to take, only some of them are good uh, given the current state we're in. And this is exactly the setting for reinforcement learning, right? We have an agent that interacts with the world, it sees the state of that world, and it takes some actions that, you know, get it into some new state of that world. So what we did in RL check is basically we say, can we actually have a, like a reinforcement learning agent that controls each of these choice points? Um, and uh, basically the way it works is that, uh, your execution feedback, you're only going to figure out it was this input you generated valid and unique. And if so, give those agents high reward. Like you did a good thing if you generated a valid and unique input. And the neat thing about this is we we actually built a prototype that just uses like basic table-based learning. So we don't need to have like an offline learning phase or anything. This works pretty well online. And the other thing is we didn't need to instrument this program. Um, so and all the other Getting whether it's your input is valid is something you can just get basically from the return status of your program. Um, and instrumentation kind of, when you're trying to track all the branches, kind of slows your program down. So as a result, when we actually compared this to Zest on uh, four of the five benchmarks we looked at in the Zest work, we found that in general, the green line, which is this RL technique, was able to find a lot more unique valid inputs than Zest was in, in small time frames because this learning was just so much faster. Um, there's a lot more work to be done. This is like kind of step one and it's really promising. See, we still had to add context manually and these other things, um, but this is a really interesting technique in showing you there's other things you can do beyond coverage guide fuzzing. And I just finally want to get to that program synthesis aspect here, right? So, We've used these generators for testing. You know, we've seen we can tweak the guidance in some different ways. Um, but you can think that testing is not the only problem that this might be useful for, right? Okay, so say we're, just to give you concrete things, say we're testing a compiler, right? We can test a compiler by writing a generator for programs. Um, and that generator generates programs until we find one that crashes our compiler. Cool, we found a bug. Um, but, this is not the only problem that requires searching through a space of programs, right? The whole point of program synthesis is to search through the space of programs until you find one that satisfies some specification you were given. So for example, you want to turn this pentagon into a star, right? You can imagine you have a generator of programs, you run that in, you get a program, you run the input through the program, you check whether the output of the program fits what you expected. If it does, congratulations, you've synthesized the program, Otherwise, you go back and you continue pulling this generator for programs. And actually, this is the approach we, uh, we tried in our work on uh, automatically synthesizing programs in this really popular data science library called Pandas in Python. Basically, there, instead of turning pentagons into stars, we're turning tables into other weird tables. We have some weird manipulations to do. Um, and this is the basics of the approach we're trying. And the really neat thing about this is that we could use this generator to kind of express the space of programs, um, to express the sort of API constraints we have. And that's actually really useful because this API is huge, 
And like, not only is it huge, but for each function, you have a whole bunch of weird constraints on the values because it's Python, it's not typed, and it's weird. And um, it can be really useful to write that API generator like directly in a language where you can call the API instead of us having to sit down and for three years build like a formal grammar that like models pandas, and then three years later they're going to have totally changed what pandas does. So that's the first really neat thing. Um, and the other thing you can imagine is obviously, Caroline, this is not going to work if you're just randomly generating programs. And yes, you are correct. It's going to take way too long because there are way too many programs. But what we can leverage here, which we can't in testing, is we actually have this precise spec of what we want, right? So we can actually condition that guidance directly based on that input-output example instead of just having to use execution feedback to kind of guide what are our good random choices. And I won't get into the details of this again, but basically, um, we have like a graph neural network which we train on a bunch of input-output examples ahead of time, and that neural network kind of backs into choice point. But we're using it very strategically, like only at these like random choice points rather than trying to get it to synthesize all of the pandas constraints on its own. And the nice thing about this is it actually, uh, the preliminary actually does scale to like real world uses of this API. Even things including like stack overflow questions that require up to chaining three API functions. That may not seem very deep, but on an API that has like 300 functions where you can have like thousands of different argument combinations for each function, this is actually really quite cool. All right. So my big takeaway of these projects is that like the subtraction of generators is one that shows up a lot. And I think that if we can get really far by smartly controlling the non-determinism in these generators to achieve different goals. So to conclude, I just want to kind of give you a summary of all I've talked so far. So I, I started all this work um, with kind of this problem that programs have bugs and that I want to be able to generate inputs that reveal bugs. And I got, was really excited by this coverage guide fuzzing technology that seemed to be really effective and actually used in practice. And we did some work where we were wondering whether we could tweak that algorithm slightly in order to find a variety of inputs with different bad behaviors. And we found that we could. And we also found that there was still some room for improvement in terms of like the mutation strategies you had in these algorithms to actually get you interesting inputs. And along the way, uh, I got really interested by this abstraction of generators. And that led me to figure out that, you know, maybe we can do more than just put a coverage guided fuzzing loop in the back end of these generators. And maybe we can actually use them to solve some other really big problems like a uh, program. Um, so that's all I have today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.